Uh, let me, okay. Okay. Um, okay, we're uh, we're ready to start. Uh, uh, folks, uh, we're ready to start. Uh, uh, those in the back of the room, if you could join us, please. In other words, stop talking. <laughs> okay. okay, just you know, I don't know these either. Okay, all right. No. Okay, we're going to invite uh, Dr. Dave uh, Philpot to join us, and. Uh, We've had uh, what I said, the national slash international expert with Jane. We have the PEI expert with Verna. Now we have uh, the Newfoundland and Labrador expert in David. And David is going to walk us and talk us through the uh, discussion paper, what led to it, uh, what we uh, what we're able to pull together in that paper, and where we'd like to see it uh, go over the next while. So, David, if you're ready, we are ready. Thank you. Okay, so I have big shoes to follow, don't I? <laughs> okay, so it's against the backdrop of Jane's national and international trend and Werner's example of PEI that we begin a discussion around what is possible for Newfoundland. Right? What can come as a made-in Newfoundland model informed by the broader context reflected of other practices in country, but uniquely tailored to, uh, to Newfoundland. And I have to start by, by thanking Verna and Jane. Uh, as Newfoundlanders, we know what it's like to try to get off this island. Uh, Verna is now teaching us what's it like to get off one island in Atlantic Canada and try to get to another island. The canceled flights, the change schedules, but she hung in and arrived at some ungodly hour last night, uh, and we really appreciate that. John joked earlier that um, um, actually, before uh, uh, Kathy and I were sitting in a conference in Toronto one time about a year and a half ago, and we heard Verna speak. And at the same time, both of us leaned over to the other one and said, "We got to get her in Newfoundland." And so it's great that you're here, Verna. Um, John joked earlier that asked Jane when she's buying a house in Newfoundland. I really think we should give her a house in Newfoundland, <laughs> <clears throat> and a nice one at that, because she's been so supportive of us as we've uh, been pushing this elephant up the hill for a number of years. Um, <clears throat> you'll also note that the graphics on the screen are reflective of the early years study three, and we did that purposely because we, the knowledge that's in the discussion paper is really a continuation of the knowledge that first came out with the, uh, from the um, early years study three. <clears throat> so, how do you do this? Okay, Jimmy Pratt Foundation launched in 2010 with a goal of promoting resiliency in children is zero to 18 and their families. So we have a very broad mandate. We recognize, of course, that at the core of promoting resiliency in children is early identification and intervention. And the best way to reach the vulnerable is through universal access to quality early child care programs uh, for all children. So <clears throat> as we start this, this, uh, this conversation, I guess, it's important to acknowledge that we're here, we're talking about early years uh, education as part of our mandate because we recognize the impact that quality early learning will have and how much that will promote resiliency in children. I'm here because my area of expertise, as you well know, is not early child education, it's special education. And I've spent 33 years in this province pushing for quality support programs for children with disabilities, dealing with 
parents of kids who are 8 and 10 and 15 years of age who are just receiving a diagnosis and I'm saying, well, you know, yes, you know, she has uh, mild autism or severe dyslexia and she's also four years behind in her reading, right? And the reactive side of our service system. And we know from all of the literature, I've continuously said that the only threat to long-term employment for me is quality early child education. And I thought that that would be enough motivation for the government to act, but, <clears throat> but apparently it has not had much of an impact. So this is really a retirement plan for me. <laughs> what we're doing here is really trying to get Dave Philpott retired. And I live for the day of that. Our history. Okay, so I'm going to go back to script for a second, because as you know, I'm an Irish Catholic in Flander, uh, and I love to talk, and I got a little tiny touch of ADHD. Um, Sandra Luskim, I heard that. Just a touch. <laughs> and I'm also standing between you and lunch, so if I don't finish on time, there's going to be problems. So we have a, a long history. In 2009, before we, uh, before we launched, we were invited by Margie McCain, actually, to join the Funders Working Group, which is a pan-Canadian network of eight, nine sort of uh, large philanthropic foundations from across the country who each share a commitment to early child education for all children. Right? So we're, it's a pan-Canadian push for quality, accessible, effective early learning education for the children across the country. And some of those foundations, just for your knowledge, certainly include the, the McCain Family Foundation, the Atkinson uh, Foundation out of Ontario, the Mudard Foundation out of Alberta, the McConnell Foundation, the Chagnon Foundation out of Quebec, uh, the Hallman Foundation, and the Lawson Foundation. And the Bell Foundation is also... Um, a part-time partner, come and go. And that group has really helped inform us as a local group. So when we speak on early child education, when we're positioning in initiatives such as this one, it's really reflective of what these foundations are pushing out as well. In 2010, we launched, and we launched with a, uh, with a partnership with the Margaret and Wallace McCain Foundation to commit $300,000 to research on early child education in this province. We felt that it was an under-researched area here. We knew the local the issues. And with our monies and McCain monies, we, we announced a $300,000 commitment. We're partway through that funding allocation now. We still have opportunities for, for other uh, funding uh, partnerships. We're always looking for partnerships and opportunities to leverage our monies uh, to support uh, research into early education. That will further inform the local context. And I encourage you to check our website, uh, our new website, which was launched yesterday, thanks to Robin, um, for details on, on some of those projects. In, in 2011, we joined the uh, Atkinson Center, or Atkinson Foundation, the Atkinson Center, uh, to partner with Environics Research to do a series of focus groups across the country uh, to gauge and explore public appetite, public interest, public knowledge around early child education uh, that could help inform public policy and drive uh, uh, agendas across the, the, the land. Um, we hosted a couple here in Newfoundland, one for uh, men. Environics uh, came up with the, did a, a, a sampling of a group of about 30 men, I guess, and another with uh, women. And it was absolutely fascinating to watch and be a part of that. We wanted to make sure, we, we supported it because we wanted to make sure the voice of Newfoundlanders is heard in the national dialogue on early education. And um, there's a report on that which you can link off our website as well. And it was fascinating. It was the only focus group across the country in which parents and, or the participants said, money's not an issue. Everywhere else, money was an issue, right? But you know, here they felt that th we have poor service not because we can't afford it, but it's not a priority for us yet. And the other thing that came through was the men were as informed as the women. It was amazing, actually. And the, the researchers themselves commented on, on how informed and knowledgeable the, the, the men were and how passionate they were around, uh, around daycare or and early child education. Uh, in 2011, we also were a part of the release, the development and the release of Early Year Study 3, which I'm sure you, you have heard about by now. Many of you, uh, you have read it and 
most of you have copies of it. If you don't have copies, we can get you copies. Um, early years study three has gone on to be the seminal document on early uh, child education, not just in Canada, but around the world. Uh, Jane, how many presentations have uh, carried on around the world on this by now? <coughs> 10, and, but an uh, international appetite for this, Brazil, Oslo, um, endless countries, I won't start. So a lot of international knowledge. So Canada is being seen as a knowledge center, a hub of, of knowledge, not just on the economics of this, but on the, the genetics of this, the human development of this, and the policy piece of this. And Pratt was very uh, proud, actually, to be a part of that. In 2012, we hosted in this very room with many of you a symposium on the implications of early year study three for Newfoundland. How could this report inform and support us in moving forward, in strengthening our uh, mo uh, models of care? And at that point, I think we had about 75 stakeholders here and a really good discussion and debate on that. John actually facilitated that as well. And there's also a report on that event on our website as well. So we've been building the local knowledge or local dialogue as it reflects the national knowledge. In 2013, actually we just received this report, we haven't read it yet, but we uh, did a funded with a partnership again with McCain, there's a theme here, partnership with McCain. They've been very supportive of us. Uh, we did a feasibility study into the development of an online degree program for Atlantic Canada, in which people can build on their existing training at the community colleges and continue on at the University of New Brunswick, which has a degree program now in early child education, and expand and extend their training into a bachelor's program. We wanted it online because we wanted it available to people in rural areas. We recognize that early child educators are terribly underpaid and undervalued, and we felt that the only way to ensure access to, to continuing education for that population was an online degree program. The, um, we haven't really read through the full report yet, but it, it has been extremely positive. The interest in it has been significant. The feasibility of it has appears solid. And the opportunities to partner with existing colleges to ensure a continuation of training seems pretty solid. I know the College of the North Atlantic has been very supportive of that and conversations are ongoing to start at the first cohort soon. We are additionally excited that as these people go on to, to continue their study, they will be in classes with other Atlantic Canadians. So someone in Hans Arbor or Goose Bay or St. John's will be studying with someone in PEI, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, or in, and in fact anywhere else in the world. So get that dialogue going around building on knowledge and building on existing practice. That report should be released within the next little while. We actually received it last week and we have no chance to read it. But we're excited. In 2013, we uh, partnered with the provincial government to do a feasibility study on establishing a model of integrated uh, childcare here. Actually, we had offered with McCain to fund a demonstration site. Uh, in uh, Newfoundland, and government felt that it wasn't ready to do that yet. So uh, we, they were ready to do a feasibility study on what could an integrated learning uh, environment look like in Newfoundland? What would be the difference between an urban uh, center? What would be the difference with a rural setting, setting? What are the opportunities to take that model and contextualize it to the unique needs of Newfoundland? We also received that report last week, and I literally haven't even printed it yet because we've been busy getting ready for this. So lots of reading next week, which means I get to sit still next week, which is a good thing. So, um, oh, and of course, we th th all that has brought us to this day in the partnership which we now have with the Harris Center. So we've been working at this for a while. We've been slowly building our own knowledge. We've been slowly building a discussion here in Newfoundland. And we've been slowly in taking that knowledge and contextualizing it to our needs. Why are we so interested in partnering with McCain, other than the fact that they're extremely supportive and generous? Well, the Margaret and Wallace McCain Foundation has been around for a long time and have a lot of knowledge. They've been pushing this elephant up the hill across the country for many years, primarily in Atlantic Canada, but not exclusively in Atlantic Canada. 
Uh, and their goal is to invest, invest money so as to inform public policy benefiting young children and their families. Their mission is to champion effective early childhood programs across the country and provide equal opportunities for all children and align the school system and operate within a provincial and territorial framework. Pretty solid mandate to jump on board with, right? Uh, the fact that it's pan-Canadian means more information for us and the fact that it's about governance and aligning with the school system. To say that they've been a good friend to us would be a terrible understatement. They have been a remarkable friend to the children of this province. The Harris Center. We want, as we start this debate, we wanted the debate to be a provincial debate. And the Harris Center has, a, a, you know, is the only regional policy development think tank in the province. And they have two primary goals, to assist in the responsible development of the economy and society of Newfoundland and Labrador, and to stimulate informed discussion on important provincial issues. So when we first pitched this idea to them last, I don't know, last February, I think, when we March, February, when we, we started this discussion, they instantly got it. They instantly said this has significant relevance for the future of our province. Right? So they saw the economic issues, they saw the employment issues, they saw the sustainability issues, and they saw the opportunity to engage in pushing out this conversation. And last evening, I was uh, sitting there at, the, at Margaret McCain's lecture, um, and I was sitting behind the president of the university, next to the chancellor of the university, and just across from the provost. And as Margie was speaking, they were nodding. Right? And I was thinking, wow, like they're getting this, right? We're getting traction here. And if the, pro if the university as the province's sole university and center of knowledge creation and knowledge mobilization in this province gets the critical importance of having this debate now, then we have traction. So I thank the Harris Center as well. They play a vital, vital role in this. So our process. Well, we've been at it for a while. The first thing we did was we explored the literature. And in exploring the literature, of course, we were aided by the, the, how current early years study three is. But the Atkinson Center out of Boise, uh, and, the, uh, uh, and in particular, Carrie McQuaig, who was one of the authors uh, on early years three, have been an invaluable resource. They have floated us countless uh, pieces of information and data and, and, and literature around this. But we wanted this to, before we even start this discussion, what is in the literature and what is, what, is, what is in the wealth of literature that has particular relevance to new plan? We identified the key themes that came out of that literature. And we also explored the local context. We looked across the province, and that was a facility as well. But the study that we had uh, is, that's, is just finishing on the uh, feasibility into an integrated setting here in Newfoundland. That study is very current, it gives a really good cross-province exploration of what is happening in our province. And there is a lot of things happening. And Carrie, uh, Jane's slide there about the different governing structures and the tapestry of services that are all over the province, disconnected and fragmented, albeit, but there's a lot of stuff happening there. <clears throat> and then we took all that and we had a focus group. We brought together about 25 key people. We invited 25 key people who were represented representative of uh, multiple sectors, private operators, public operators, educators, healthcare, parents, men, women, policy makers. Uh, so very cross-representative group of people. And we had a focus group in which we floated the key themes that we felt would eventually land in the paper and ask for their feedback. And uh, we got really good feedback. They were, uh, it was extremely passionate group of people actually. And, a couple of things that stood out to me, I won't go, in, the report of that is also on our website, so if you want to know exactly what came out of that, you just need to go to the Pratt website. But one of the, the big things that stood out to us is that they didn't want bad news. They did not want a discussion paper that says what's wrong. They wanted a discussion paper that was written in positive language, accessible language so that people could understand it, and that was relevant and directive for moving us forward, not looking back and pointing fingers and naming things. That, that, were, that was inappropriate. So it was a wonderful experience, actually, and we're thankful we had it. And then we hired a writer. We wanted someone objective and removed from us the right to take all the information that 
we had at that point, including the focus group, and to write a, a, a paper that was ex accessible and succinct. And uh, the person we hired was Marie Ryan, who's here today. And not only did Marie do a very good job with the paper, yes, by all means. <clears throat> Not only did, uh, did, did uh, Marie do a very good job with the paper, she was extremely easy to collaborate with. I, in my day job, the other half, I've been involved in many collaborative writing projects, and I swear, every time I do it, I swear I'll never do it again. And this is the first time in my career in which I jump at the chance to do it again. Right? So Marie, thank you for that. And then yesterday, we released the paper. And right after we released it, we met with government and gave them copies of it. And it's interesting, not to tell tales of what happened, but the government said, we will take your report. And we said, oh, no, no, it's not a report. It's a conversation. And it's not a conversation with you. It's a conversation among the citizens of the province. You are not our tar target audience, and neither are you for that matter. Right? This is a conversation we want to have happening out in the community. Right? So the, the, paper, the goal of the paper is pretty clear. Goal of the paper, right on track, Dave. How rare is that? <clears throat> so, our goal is to create a year-long conversation on what quality ECE could mean in our province. We're not suggesting that we copy PEI. We're not suggesting we reach where Quebec is. In fact, we're pretty much certain that what's happening in PEI and what's happening in Quebec won't happen in St. John's. And what's happening in St. John's will not, happen, will not work in St. Anthony. And what's happening, working in St. Anthony, will not be either wanted or work in Natwishish, right? But we want the citizens of this province to have a discussion around what it could mean for them. That's based on the existing knowledge out there and globally. So in other words, when parents start talking about what's possible for their children, it's reflective of the knowledge that exists around what's possible for their children contextualized to our province, and mirrors Canadian practice. Basically, what we want for our children is informed services. We're, strategic, we're very strategic in this as well, because we're aware of a couple of things. We are aware that we are two years out from the provincial election, and that usually with provincial elections, platforms start getting developed about a year before the election occurs. So as our conversation comes to a close a year from now, the parties, all three political parties, will be thinking, what should we put in our platform? And we want those politicians to be aware of the conversation that just occurred. We're also aware, all three parties, I stress, we're also aware that next November is Jane, the index, the uh, early child index that was in early years three, which gives a national report on how the provinces are progressing in their development of early years. A year from now, that report comes out again for the second time. Right? So when that report comes out, we want the citizens of the province to look to it and see its relevance. Why is this report important for us at this point? So if nothing else, we are, um, we are we're trying to be very strategic in what we're doing. So, the paper itself, Early Years Last a Lifetime. We can't figure out who, for the, who came up with that a title between, I swear it was Gary McGregg. Maybe nine years later, one day Oh, there, I learned something new. <laughs> but we're not giving them credit now. We're going to give credit to Marie Ryan. <laughs> so I'm going to walk you through how the paper structure and what the key points uh, that are in it are. We start with a preamble, and the preamble, I guess, speaks to the critical importance of the first five years of a child's life. It speaks to the fact that we know 85% of the brain is developed by the time a child finishes kindergarten, and that nutrition, the physical environment, nurturance, love, food, attention are all essential parts of that development. We talk a lot about rights. We talk about the child's right to the best possible uh, childhood they, they can have, the right to daily lives in healthy and secure spaces and places, the right to high quality, inclusive, fun, early learning environments that encourage investigation and play. But we also talk about parents' rights, the right of parents that know that they have choices for their children, 
and not the choices that are based on what they were lucky enough to find or what family members they had around, but were based upon research and science and proven practice. It talks about quality early learning experiences and stimulating uh, environments having lasting impacts. I and mean, we know about the improved self-confidence and self -esteem, heightened self-esteem that comes out of quality early learning. We talk about the improved health that comes out of early learning. The studies that say that kids who are involved in solid early learning programs have higher creativity and stronger social skills. They have enhanced problem solving skills and perseverance. They're more successful in schools and in the workplace and they're more engaged citizens and more productive members of society. So the, 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 the impact of, of, of involvement. And we also say that the research on this is volumes. It's not new research. It's been in existence for years. Uh, and it's globally consistent in stating that early child education is good for children, it's good for families, it's good for uh, communities, and it's good for economies. Uh, so we want this conversation to be contextualized with Newfoundland, but informed by this, by this backdrop. And there's no reason in the world why we can't have an exemplary model. Why Newfoundland, in the days, you know, uh, blossoming economy here in Newfoundland, why we can't lead the country. Why we can't be seen as being the Quebec, the new Quebec of early child uh, education. We also take great care in defining what is early learning and what we mean by, uh, by quality early learning. We state explicitly that this is not about school, schoolifying children or putting kids in desks or putting kids in classrooms. It's about accessible and inclusive healthy places and spaces. It recognizes the critical and supports and validates the, the, the role of parents as a child's first teacher and about the importance and talks about the importance of play and interaction led by qualified professional and caring educators. Margie last night spoke to the need for us to validate the legitimacy of the profession of early child education, right? And the critical service that they don't only bring to the children, but to the parents of these children, right? Yes, they work with kids, but they also work with parents. And we have the oft of recognition in this province of that. Um, and that's part of the reason why we're working with the UNB around the degree program. We also discussed that, that we're, not, we're, we're not talking about one setting, right? We're talking about a continuum of settings and spaces. We're talking about homes and, and, and uh, 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 business type settings. We're talking about integrating settings. We're talking about community. So we're talking about multiple uh, spaces based upon community needs. And we also talked about a push for seamless delivery. Right? We don't support this, you know, the, the, many, the experience of many families today in which the child has to get dropped off at one place so that the mom can get to work on time. Then the, from that place, they had to go to kindergarten. From kindergarten, they had to go to another setting. And from that setting, they end up in an after-school setting. So that, you know, a lot of research is coming out talking about how disruptive transitions are in young children's life. So we're focusing on, on a more a seamless delivery model which lessens the tre stress in the child's life as well as the stress and expense on the families. In the third section, I guess we're getting into towards the meat of the paper now, um, and we, we speak in greater detail to the benefits that the, the research says, uh, the wealth of research I referenced a, a, a few minutes ago. Um, Early identification and intervention prevents long-term expensive programs. It prevents secondary issues uh, that are associated with learning disabilities. It prevents the eroded self-confidence. It prevents the disengagement children start feeling in grade three if they're struggling. It prevents the dropout that goes on. It, ex it prevents the expensive system of special education. In 2007, I was hired to write the, um, the special education report, the review on the special education report. And, and what we found in that study was that, uh, we found a lot of things in that study, but one of the things we found was that up to a quarter of the children in the province are being placed in special education, right? And the outcomes aren't any better down the road, right? If we could go upstream, right, and get these kids earlier, what would the rate of participation in special education be in this province, right? We're bringing Ted Malouche in from the UK um, in uh, March. 
And Ted's done the, long, the longitudinal studies which looks at the impact of quality and quantity of early child education and its impact on educational outcomes and special education participation rates. Right? Overwhelming data. He also presented at the conference that Werner presented at and um, um, Kathy and I leaned over to one another a second time and said, got to get him, him the new plan as well. So he's coming in March and I'm terrified he's going to learn about fog before he comes. But <laughs> it also taught, <coughs> excuse me, just getting over a cold. <coughs> It also talks about the economics of early childhood. Section 3 talks about the economics of early child development uh, and how, um, how it's so linked with economic prosperity and productive. And that, in fact, early child education is an economic producer. It produces, the, it strengthens the economy. In fact, you get more investment from er, investing, more return from investing in early child education than you do in many other sectors. Uh, <clears throat> Here in Newfoundland, we're having a conversation right now around our ability to meet our labor market demands. But nowhere in that conversation is the importance of early child education and the role that that plays. We're also having a conversation here about population growth and attracting new families. But nowhere in that conversation is a discussion on uh, the impact of early child education and whether or not families, in particular young families, are going to move to Newfoundland knowing that the options for their young children are so poor. And finally, there's a, the Premier spoke last week, I think, about the critical importance of improving the, by the economic status of women in this province. But we're not talking about how disruptive uh, uh, ha having to take time off work to raise kids is to, uh, uh, to mom's career paths and the economic cost of, of, uh, of childcare. We know overwhelmingly that the best way, the single biggest way to have moms return to work is to provide quality early learning. So as we're having these other conversations in the province, rightly so, we have to recognize that there's a piece underlying all of these that is common, and that is access to quality early learning and care. We know the families are changing, communities are changing, and economies are changing. The average number of children per family has dropped to 1.9. Uh, both parents had to work today, not just to meet their family's financial needs, but to meet the needs of their communities as well. Today, women are much more active in the workplace. 66% of women with children under age 6 are employed. And the presence of young children also has a greater impact on the employment of lone mothers. In 2009, 45% of lone mothers with children under the age of 3 were employed, compared with 66% of mothers in two parent families. Right? So it's, it's a, a significant I issue, as, as Kerry McGregg says, in today's economy, the mere fact of having children places women at risk of poverty without you know, the, the, uh, the uh, access to early childcare. 35% of women who work part-time say they do so because they have no choice as they're caring for children. But it's also a wise economic investment. Every dollar invested in early learning increases the e economy's output by at least $2.54. If it's done right, and the studies out of Quebec show this, if it's done right, it will pay for itself. In fact, it will turn a profit. For every dollar invested in early child education in Quebec, the Quebec government gets back $1.05, and the federal government gets back $0.44 cents without doing a thing. All right? So we're talking about structuring, economically structuring early child care so it's, it's effective. But more important than the economics coming out of Quebec, Quebec has taken women from the low... The, Quebec's investment in early child education has taken women from the lowest level of employment in the country to the highest. It has, they now have, fathers in Quebec have the highest rate of paternity leave. Can you imagine how much childhood would change if fathers were able to take time off and parent their kids? Can you imagine how the impact that would have? And the Quebec experience has decreased uh, family poverty by 50% in Quebec. So while it makes economic sense in Quebec and why, while it may have started as a cultural and language issue, the spin-off benefits from Quebec are profound. Section 4, uh, watching my clock here, um, Section 4 talks about the Newfoundland context uh, and uh, the lack of priority that this has received uh, historically. 
in 2012, there were approximately 29,800 children from birth to five years of age in Newfoundland. While well, almost 60% of these children have mothers employed in the labor force, there are licensed childcare spaces for 19%. Newfoundland ranks last among the 10 Atlantic provinces, as you saw by Jane's index. Um, we acknowledge that government has two distinct strategies, the Learning from the Start program led by the Department of Education and Caring for Our Future, uh, the provincial strategy for quality, sufficient and affordable childcare in Newfoundland led by the, the Department of Child, Youth and Family Services. Mm -hmm. We acknowledge that there's many, many, many good things in both of those strategies, right? They call the double Newfoundland's investment um, uh, uh, by 2022 and improving policy and you know, uh, looking at uh, training and retention of early child educators. But we are concerned that it's a 10-year strategy. And we don't feel it's appropriate to let two generations of children go by while we're waiting to get to where we need to be. And research out of the Atkinson Center are clearly indicating that even if government meets all its markers by 2022, we will still lag the other provinces because the other provinces are out investing us in this area, even though they are not in the financial situation that we are in. We know that 80% of five-year-olds in the country are in full day kindergarten. I would be interested in knowing how many child, how many kindergartens in Newfoundland go to daycare in the, af the, in the afternoon session. My guess is that 80% of Newfoundland children are also in school for a full day, except that it's at least two, if not three sites. Uh, <clears throat> and we challenge government, as Jane spoke this morning, to take the simple step of integrating governance. Right? If they did nothing else in the, in the short term but integrated governance, that would have a big impact. And of course we brought Verna Bruce here before I spoke because we wanted to display that it's not a pipe dream. It's something that's very attainable. Section 5, the opportunity in Newfoundland. We talk here about um, the why it's so right. Like, If we don't have this discussion now, when can we have this discussion? At what point in our history have we ever been positioned as well as we are now to talk about improving early child care? Untold economic growth, uh, growth and influence, higher levels of employment than ever before, housing starts up, uh, an increasingly mobile workforce, optimism around the economics in our province. Right? But with that come significant challenges. There's higher cost of living, housing costs are up, more pressure on families to work, fractured networks of care, the out-migration of parents uh, either in province or out of province to work and the loss of, of networks of care around that, and the, um, the uh, pressure on parents to find and, and lock into some type of care for their young children. We continuously hear the word, uh, when, we hear, when we speak to, to young parents about their child care, we continuously hear the phrase, well, I was lucky, you know? I, got, I, was, I was lucky enough to find, is almost always prefaces what happens. Luck should have nothing to do with raising children in this province. Um, and we talk about uh, labor force growth as a key component in economic growth, but it's not the only factor. It's no longer enough. In, given how mobile our populations are now and our workforce are and uh, the demand for skilled and unskilled labor across the country and the differences in pay range, it's hard for us. It's, it's no longer enough to offer a job. Parents want the full package. They want to know what the housing costs are. They want to know what the child care arrangements are. They want to know what the educational system is like. So if we're going to have this com conversation around growing our economy or even sustaining our current economy, right, we have to talk early child education. And we go so far as to su suggest a starting point. Actually, you'll see in the discussion paper, we recommend that the province act immediately on implementing a full day kindergarten. We also go so far as to say to implement a full day preschool, a uh, uh, junior kindergarten for four year olds. Uh, we ask them to fast track their current 10 year plan to 2016. And we ask them to integrate governance. So we're very explicit in steps to be taken immediately. Um, in closing, I think I'm going to read, I haven't read from the paper, but there's nothing worse than being. Uh, read too, although it's lots to be said for story time. Um, <laughs> I'm going to bring this to a close by reading the, the, how we close the paper. And, and I do this in tribute to Marie's writing and uh, because I think she really succinctly nails the closing. 
Creating a successful integrated early learning strategy from Newfoundland's current service patchwork demands strong leadership. It requires effective and efficient policies that meet individual, social, cultural, and economic objectives. It requires the integration of services through collaboration at, at all levels. It requires a commitment to quality in early learning. The future of children born in Newfoundland tomorrow will be shaped by the decisions we make today. From this generation will come community leaders who will play a critical role in determining Newfoundland's future, health, economic prosperity, and sustainability. The path we take today will determine their future and ours. A child's early learning indeed does last a lifetime. So next steps. Uh, you're not our target audience. You're a part of our messaging, right? So we want your input. We want your feedback on this. We want endorsements of this. We want people to buy into this and say, yes, this is an important conversation that we should be having. But we want you to join the conversation. And Verna's advice this morning about using your networks and engaging your stakeholders, right? Uh, I think that the title of our follow-up paper will be gentle pressure relentlessly applied. <laughs> <laughs> and we know who will be giving credit for that title. So again, our intention is strategic, it's overt, and it's timely. Start talking. And make sure that conversation is informed by what is possible for our children. OK, thank you. I'm fine. Uh, I'm sure there's a question or comment uh, on what Dave had to present. Uh, he would make a very convincing preacher, I'm sure. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, with or without a collar. So that's a, a good job, Dave. Her. So any, any questions or comments? Process themes, Kathy? Yes, uh, and we're um, actually Mike Claire from the Harris Center is going to speak a little later on our. We have an agenda partially planned for the coming year, um, but we have the year. We, we have a plan. Multiple steps. <laughs> so I spent uh, some time in Great River this <coughs> summer. So that's a population of about 80 people. Uh, 13, I think, school kids. And uh, I was hearing the presentation this morning. I said, oh, you know, how is this going to work in Great River? Because it's a very dynamic community. Lots of pride. And people are actually <coughs> coming back to the community. And to Dave's point, if, if we can make this work, and there's no reason why we can't, whatever the it is, uh, then that community has a path for survival. And Brunswick is next door. We have up on Coast Labrador. You know, and that's, I think, a, the potential magic of this whole approach. And I think the rural politician and the community leaders and the educators hopefully will, will start to see this. And then the urban issue, which we have all that Vern talked about, and, you know, again, each day, uh, certainly there's real opportunity there. Uh, now, since there are no other comments at this point, uh, Dave and Vern and Jane are going to be back after lunch, and we're going to have open, really open it up for, for discussion. I want you to probe, uh, probe uh, uh, them, uh, because it's going to be very helpful for, I think, us, but and, and yourselves to get a better understanding of the of the possible here, and we'll lead into to discussion, and to Roseanne's question. I mean, the, the the what we hear this afternoon is going to feed into both process issues that we're trying to grapple with as as a as a team, uh, but also the substance. 
and that's going to be very, very important. Uh, and I think Kathy, when she mentioned about her visit with the Premier, you know, are we presenting a fait accompli? Definitely not. But already it's like, all right, and we got to bring those conversations uh, uh, together very, very quickly over, over the next 12 months. Uh, so lunch is served. We got about